that can be so relieving when you do hit a uh, set of discretes uh, because you can kind of just take a breath and take them one at a time, which is great. Madeline back for another MCAT podcast. Uh, my tears have dried up from last week's passage. <laughs> this week, we are jumping in to a set of discretes. I, I always like to, to just remind students the general kind of cadence of a section on the MCAT. So last week was passage five of bio biochem. Is that going to be the same every time bio biochem passage five? I know that the next, when I click next, it's going to take me to a set of discretes. Uh, usually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So usually it's like, you know, three passages, discrete, two passages, discrete, three passages, discrete, two passages. So that is the general cadence um, okay. of the exam. Okay. It's good to to always be aware of what to expect moving forward because that's that's the worst is like, okay, this next one's going to be discrete and then you turn into a passage. And I'm like, no, I wanted to set a discrete <laughs> to reset my mind. Um, so that's good. What is your general kind of mindset? I, I love talking about mindset and strategy around just the, the thought process thought process going into these. Um, for a set of discretes, do you have any specific mindset or thought process going into them? Yeah. So discretes, I always just love because I was like, I don't have to look at that. Passage. Especially <laughs> it's like last week's where it was hard. It's like, oh, I'm done with that. <laughs> like, yeah. That's done. That's back. I can now, you know, just go question by question. And the great thing about discretes, this can be great or this can be awful depending on who you are and where you are in your journey, is that they're very content based. They're not as like, I have to be looking at back the passage. I have to be doing as much figure analysis. So in that way, they are usually much more able to you are more able to predict the answer choice going into them um, based on your content knowledge previously. Um, there's a lot less analysis and having to connect the dots, which can be, if that's your strength, it can be so relieving when you do hit a uh, set of discretes uh, because you can kind of just take a breath and take them one at a time, which is great. Yeah, all right. Let's go and dive into our discretes today. So I'll start here, question 27. Simulation of the iris dilator muscle is a result of activation of A, sympathetic motor neurons, B, parasympathetic motor neurons, C, the fifth cranial nerve, or D, sympathetic sensory neurons. All right, with my wife being a neurologist, she would kill me if I got this one wrong, but I'm going to sit here and struggle for a second. So iris dilator muscle. So Iris, right? We know the iris is the the little thing in the in the eye that uh, gives us our pupil, um, mm -hmm. and so if that dilates, right, our iris is getting bigger, our pupil is getting bigger, um, and so I'm going to try to figure out what is causing that. So sympathetic motor neurons to me wouldn't be the answer because sympathetic to me would cause constriction, if I remember correctly. Uh, B, parasympathetic motor neurons, sure, maybe, right? Because it's the opposite of what I said is, is not it. Uh, C, the fifth cranial nerve. So if I were to try to remember the fifth cranial nerve, oh, oh, touch. Uh, um. What is that fifth cranial nerve? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, what's the fifth cranial nerve? Um, it does facial expressions and chewing. Okay, facial expressions and chewing. What, what is, what's the actual nerve, though? I can't think of it. Oh, my oh, gosh, oh, oh, two. It's touch. It's a T. Um, um, I cannot think. Fifth cranial. I'm going to Google it as we as we are live here. It. Oh, trigeminal. Duh. Um, <laughs> of course it is. So, <laughs> so tri trigeminal doesn't seem right to me. And then sympathetic sensory neurons. So sympathetic sensory neurons, right? Sensory neurons wouldn't cause um, any sort of muscle uh, contraction or relaxation. Um, they're sensory. So motor neuron, I, I'm going to say B, parasympathetic motor neuron, because again, A, sympathetic to me is is going to be uh, con um, contracting that muscle. 
So it's actually, I like that you were able to say that. So when we are thinking about this, I think going into it kind of with a with a prediction, if you do kind of know what's going to be happening during that sympathetic response can be really useful. Um, but our sympathetic, when we talk about sympathetic, I always think of sympathy or like that heart. Um, so it's going to be having to do with like, you know, increasing your heart rate, increasing your respiration, really yep. trying to get ready for fight our or flight. flight. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and so actually when we dilate our eyes, we're actually allowing more sun to get in or more light in order to help us see better. Um, and so it actually aids in that idea of fight or flight. So just with that information, we actually might be able to say, okay, it's actually going to be A because it has to do with our fight or flight. Oh, and we'll, um, really? Just, yes. Really? See, to, However, to me, to me, constricting is focusing in fight or flight. I got to focus. So I'm going to constrict and focus on what's in front of me. We will be constricting kind of the muscles in our eyes to able to dilate. Um, so there's kind of like a, a difference in thought process there. Cause so constricting your muscle is actually going to dilate your eye. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh... You're so close. You had it on the two <laughs> motor neurons. I think the other yeah. thing too is parasympathetic uh, rest and digest. That's not really talked about right here. Yep. Um, so you might be able to also uh, count it out for that. All right. All right. <laughs> Can't get them all right. All right. I got to apologize to my neurologist wife. (laughs) 28. Increasing plasma concentration of aldosterone is most likely to be followed by which of the following? So what does aldosterone do? Basically, I think is a good rewording of this. So before I even went in, um, this is a little bit of a content heavy question. Um, You might just have a little bit of a definition ready for your head for what aldosterone is. So aldosterone is actually going to be a hormone uh, that goes through your blood and actually is going to try to increase your blood pressure via interacting on the kidneys to absorb your sodium, basically sodium ions. Sodium conservation. Exactly. Sodium conservation. So just with that definition, I think you could go into this and get the answer correct. So A, increase water reabsorption through increased aquaporin channels in the collecting duct. This didn't say anything about sodium reabsorption, so we're going to say X out to that. B, increased sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule. This one makes sense. (laughs) C, decreased water reabsorption in the collecting duct. Also doesn't make sense based on our prediction. And D, decreased plasma calcium concentration. So this doesn't talk about its actual effects necessarily. Um, Also, we said reabsorption is kind of the big thing that it does with sodium, so that also wouldn't make sense. So just based on that kind of prediction, B is going to be the right answer here. You get all the easy ones. I see how it is. You know, I was, I, so I saw this and I was like, ah, sorry, man. Uh, that's all right. So aldosterone, got to know what those hormones do. Mm-hmm. Uh, question 29. When normal human cells are grown in culture, they will divide a limited number of times, typically 50 rounds of mitosis. After this number is reached, the cells become apoptotic. This cell death is a result of, all right, so basically, how do cells die? (laughs) Um, A, decreasing number of membrane-bound organelles per cell. B, decreasing number of non-membrane-bound organelles per cell. C, decreasing levels of growth hormone. Or D, chromosomal telomeres shortening after each round of division. All right, so... I am pretty sure the answer to this is D um, because I love trying to figure out how do we how do we um, have the fountain of youth and it's all about maintaining those telomeres. <sighs> I love that. Um, it actually is going to be D exactly for that. And you know what's great is because the science section basically allows any outside knowledge. Maybe you didn't actually know what telomeres are, but because you know. You know, maybe it has something to do with anti-aging creams or fountain <laughs> of youth, et cetera. Yep. If that's how you got that information, if that's how you get that correct answer, then it it doesn't matter if it's, you know, you know the exact mechanism. Sometimes yep. we do take like our, our inclinations or what we've heard outside of our NCAT study and we can apply it. So that's actually a really great way to say, hey, I know this because of something else in my life. Yeah. But that works just as well. It's not like cars where you can't bring in outside information. Yep. Anything fair game here. So great. Yeah. Cool. All right. I got an easy one for once. Yay. (laughs) All right. Next one. 
Um, a student finishes an experiment involving several bacteria, which are highly pathologic in humans. She wishes to dispose of the agar plates and micro pet tips she, she used. Which of the following procedures should she carry out? So basically, she's trying to sterilize her bacterial infested stuff. How is she <laughs> going to do it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, so, it's it's funny because the question, I, this is one where I would go back to Blueprint and change your question because it's it says she wishes to dispose of, not she wishes to sterilize, mm -hmm. right? To dispose yes. of, throw it in the trash. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's a great thing. So true. And I think that's one of those things when we're talking about like experimental design, um, especially when we're talking within a lab, dispose of is never just throw away. If yeah. Anybody who's at home <laughs> or at school and has done Ochem, Gen Chem, Bio Labs, there's a process. Yeah. They're <laughs> highly <laughs> pathologic to humans. Who cares? <laughs> throw it in the trash. <laughs> exactly. So those wordings uh, do, do not mean, you know, just throw it away. There's definitely, you know, this, this thought process that leads us to it has to be a highly sterile yep. situation. So A, microwave all materials for more than 60 seconds. B, wipe down all materials with a 100% ethanol solution. C, place all materials in an open container, metal container, and autoclave the container. Place all material, and D, place all materials under a UV light for 90 seconds. Mm. So, uh, uh, answer choice C stands out as one. It's like, ooh, autoclave. I know autoclave is used in the hospital and it sterilizes things. Um, but not everything is autoclavable. <laughs> So just the way that autoclave works, like it'll destroy materials. Um, and so I don't know if you can autoclave agar plates and micro pipette tips. Um, so that one I think is like one that you want to pick, but it's probably not the right answer. Um, microwave all materials for more than 60 seconds. Uh, I, I wish we could fix things that easily, potentially. Mm -hmm. Um Wipe down all materials with a hundred percent ethanol solution, right? And that one potentially makes sense, right? We we know alcohol kills viruses and bacteria, and it has to be a certain percentage. And hundred percent seems pretty strong, so potentially that one. Uh, and then materials under UV light for ninety seconds. So again, we know UV light destroys bacteria and viruses and stuff, but is 90 seconds long enough? Um, my gut tells me 90 seconds is not long enough and that the answer choice is probably gonna be the ethanol solution. Cool. So I would say one thing about this as you're going through them is I like how you kind of got rid of A and D because maybe not long enough, they put a time constriction on there. And that's a, that's a really specific thing that sometimes I think like, am I really expected to know 60 versus 90 seconds for these two yeah. <laughs> techniques? Um, so I actually also crossed those out as maybe possibly not being strong enough. Okay. And then I was between B and C. And when you talk about wiping down materials with a hundred percent ethanol solution, I mean, I think about like wiping down my house, I can wipe down every single surface, <laughs> but I still miss something. Yeah. And when you're talking about something that is so tiny as micro pipette tips and agar plates, there's a high likelihood that even if you wipe down those materials with hundred percent ethanol five, six times that you still didn't do it a hundred percent. Um, to 100% like efficacy. Yeah. So because of that, oh. it actually brings in a mirror, error of, me of error, measure of error. So it actually has to be C. <sighs> and I think part of this is you you kind of picked up on the most important thing. Autoclave is the strongest thing here. Yep. Um, it's used in hospitals, it's used in labs. And they're not really telling us the types of materials necessarily going in. They're saying, you know, micro pet tips and other things, but they're not necessarily saying, hey, these can't go in there. They're just saying, what's going to kill the stuff? what's going to kill the pathologic thing and autoclave is going to be your answer here. Cause it's just the strongest. It's going to, I think it's the temperature of like 120 and yeah. a pressure of like two ATM. Yeah. Like that kills anything. <laughs> and they just want to kill this thing. Yeah. We got to kill it before it gets out and causes another pandemic. Yeah. Uh, yeah we don't want okay. to do this. <laughs> so I, I tried to complicate it too much by going, Oh, agar plates can't go in an autoclave. Right. That's where I was. I was bringing in too much outside knowledge, knowing that there are certain things that can and can't go in an autoclave. And I do think sometimes like we do, we do this very often. And I have so many students come to me and say, I just feel like that the answer is so much simpler. Like I overthink it. I overthink it. And sometimes I just have to say, like, you have to have confidence in yourself. Like if you yeah. think that you know it, you might know it. <laughs> like that's a great thing to know, to, to feel and to just allow yourself to, to have those answers where you know it and you can go on. 
Oh, all right. So, unfortunately, discreets go by very quickly, and we uh, we don't have we don't have the joy of staying in discreets the whole time because that would make the MCAT too easy. So, um, the the discreets are are done, and then just getting back into that mindset of okay, a passage is next. Whatever it'll be, it'll be. I'm gonna enjoy it. Right, just take it.